RCA, the most trusted name in television. Hello there. The television tape recorder is undoubtedly the most complex piece of equipment normally employed in a television broadcast studio. I believe it's worth our while to learn something about these machines, not only because they have become important basic tools in the broadcast industry, but also because they illustrate the practical application of a great, great variety of advanced electronics techniques. The objective of a television tape recorder is almost self-evident. It is to record complete television programs, both picture and sound, on magnetic tape. Now, the tape employed is basically very similar to the familiar audio tape, quarter-inch wide, used uh, in the both professional and home style of audio recorders. However, there is an important difference in the tape used with these large television tape recorders. The tape itself is considerably wider. It's two inches wide. It is, however, deposited in the form of an oxide coating on mylar, very much like audio tape. Now, because the problem of impressing television signals on tape is considerably more complex, we find that a very complex pattern is required in the, on the tape itself. The information is recorded in the form of a series of tracks, as you see indicated in this little sketch. This shows the two-inch width of the tape. You'll note that a control track is laid down across the upper edge of the tape. An audio track is found across the lower edge, as it's portrayed in this sketch. And the video information is deposited in the form of a series of transverse tracks extending across the width of the tape. These are nominally 10 mils or thousandths of an inch wide and are separated by guard bands of about 5.6 mils. There is also an additional audio track known as the Q track, which is adjacent to the control track along the upper edge of the tape, as you see it here. The reason for employing this basic transverse scanning technique is to obtain the very high writing speeds that are need needed to record the high bandwidth video signals. Let's take a look at some of the mechanical aspects of the television tape recorder as we begin our exploration as to how it works. Much of what you see here on the tape transport panel is self-evident. Here is a supply reel and a take-up reel down immediately below it. We can trace out the path of the tape quite readily. As it leaves the supply reel, it first passes a stabilizing arm, which controls the tension on the tape as it passes through the active portion of the machine. The tape then passes over an air-lubricated guide. Air under slight pressure is forced under a series of of holes in the upper surface of this guide so that the tape literally floats past on a cushion of air. Next, the tape is passed by a master erase head, which serves to clean off any signal that might previously be, have been recorded on the tape. This is, is used, of course, only in the record mode of operation. Within this housing is located the basic video head wheel assembly, where the transverse scanning is accomplished that records the video information on the tape. Behind this little plastic cover right here is the actual video head wheel, a set of four heads which are mounted in the rim of a wheel approximately two inches in diameter. We'll see some close-up views of this uh, type of, uh, of this part of the system a little bit later. For the moment, let's simply note that the tape is cupped by the action of a metal guide that you see in this region here so that it conforms to the circumference of this rotating head wheel where the video recording actually takes place. The tape then emerges from this housing and passes along to a cluster of heads associated with the audio and cue channels. You may be able to observe two posts that bear against the tape, against the oxide surface of the tape in about this location right here. Uh, the first of these contains a pair of erase heads that erase narrow stripes along the appropriate uh, regions of the tape along near the two edges. And the following post then is the audio and cue record head where audio or uh, cue information is recorded in the appropriate tracks. 
Next, we encounter the capstan where the driving force is imparted to the tape. In normal uh, service, of course, the pinch roller that you see right here would be jammed against the capstan to exert a grip on the tape. Then we encounter a counting capstan, which is mechanically coupled to an elapsed time meter, which is uh, in this area right here uh, to enable an operator to keep track of where he is on a reel of tape. Finally, another stabilizing arm, and the tape is wound up on a uh, take-up reel. Well, the basic mechanical arrangement, you'll note, is not uh, very different from what you'll encounter in an audio recorder, with the very important exception that this video head wheel assembly is needed in order to record the uh, very important video information. Now, let's take a look at one of these video head wheel panels that has been removed from a television tape recorder so that we can see some of its important details a little more readily. I have such a head wheel panel uh, over in this area here that's been removed from the panel and, and laid down horizontally. Uh, normally, the tape would pass through in this area right here, be cut by this vacuum guide to conform to the circumference of the head wheel that you see in this location right here. Now, one of the details that you can see quite readily in this particular view is the cluster of brushes and slip rings right in this area right here, which are used to conduct signals to and from the rotating heads. You'll notice a total of five of these brush and slip ring assemblies. There's one for each of the four head channels plus a common return for the four heads themselves. Now, the heads are mounted around the rim of this wheel, which, as I indicated, is roughly two inches in diameter. Uh, they're a little difficult to see in this kind of a view, but I think perhaps you can make out one right under the pencil point right here. 90 degrees later along the wheel, there's a second head, a third one, and a fourth head. Four heads mounted around the circumference of this rotating wheel. Now, down at the other end of the motor shaft, this obviously is the motor which drives the head wheel, you'll find a little magnetic tone wheel. This is nothing more than a metal disc with one tiny notch in its uh, periphery. You can see it at this point right here. Uh, this uh, tone wheel, of course, makes one revolution for each revolution of the head wheel since it's directly coupled to the same shaft, and it rotates very close, not quite touching, but very close to a magnetic pickup head in this region right here. So a little pulse signal is generated every time the video head wheel makes exactly one revolution. Now, one other very important aspect of the a video head wheel panel is the vacuum guide, which can be released and swung back from the head wheel as I am now doing. Here you see the inner curved surface, which causes the tape to be cupped so that it does conform to the circumference of the wheel. Uh, there's vacuum applied through some grooves in this guide by means of a little hose that you, see, that you see extending off in this direction here. And there's also a control track head mounted on the guide assembly, uh, mounted in such a way that it bears against the oxide surface of the tape, the inner surface of the tape, to lay down a control track, uh, whose function we'll discuss a little bit later, uh, almost immediately after the video information has been recorded as the heads move past the tape in this general area right here. Now again, as we'll see a little later, the precise positioning of this vacuum guide is very important. It's important that the, dimension, the dimensions associated with the playback process be virtually identical to those associated with the recording process, or there will be geometric distortions in the final picture. Well, that, I think, gives us some impression of the, uh, one of the key mechanical components in the television tape recorder. We might now consider a little bit about the electronic circuits. In the lower part of the machine, there are banks of modules containing transistorized circuits associated with the electronic part of the machine to provide suitable uh, uh, record and record currents and to amplify the playback signals from the actual audio and video recording heads and also to provide appropriate driving power for the several motors associated with the transport. Before we examine any of these modules in detail, I think it would be worthwhile to look at a block diagram of the basic video recording system for this type of machine. Such a block diagram is displayed over here on the easel. The video signal is enough more complex relative to a, an audio signal that it's necessary to employ a great deal of processing in the process of putting it on the tape and getting it back off. The video signal, as it's first brought into the machine, is first impressed on an FM carrier. So the signal that is actually recorded on the tape is not the original video signal, but is actually an FM wave. This, this gets around certain 
uh, serious limitations in the recording medium with respect to basic linearity. The FM signal is passed through a group of four record amplifiers which provide currents for four, the four video heads mounted in the head wheel. The connections to the video heads are brought in through slip rings and brushes, as you see in this, indicated in this area up here. There is a record playback relay or the equivalent that enables the set of heads to be switched between the record and the playback modes. Now for the process of playback, the same heads are used to generate signal currents which are brought into a four channel set of playback amplifiers and equalizers. It's necessary to adjust the frequency response in a number of respects uh, and equalize the signals generally to preserve good signal quality. Then, because there are four head channels, but we want only one signal at the output of the recorder, it's necessary to employ a group of switching circuits which transform the four head channels into a single FM signal, which is then applied to the demodulator, uh, which in turn recovers the video signal. Now, the video signal, as it emerges from the demodulator in a tape recorder, uh, is not of particularly high quality. It is contaminated by switching transients, by uh, some of the distortion which is in inevitable in the processing to which it's been subjected. So the signal is passed through a processing amplifier which is capable of cleaning up some portions of the television signal. In particular, the sink and blanking signals, which are highly standardized, can be regenerated almost completely. If the machine is then employed for color television recording and playback, there would be a set of color stabilization circuits which perform further operations on the signals before the signal is finally delivered to the outside world. Now, in a monochrome type of machine, the circuits that you see outlined in the dotted lines here may not be required. Most practical television tape recorders are so designed that they can be used optionally for either monochrome or color recording. Well, with that much background on some of the theoretical considerations involved in the record and playback process, let's examine some of the actual uh, uh, circuit modules as they are employed in this particular type of machine. Over in this panel on the left, we have a number of the modules or amplifiers associated with the recording process. Uh, the the uh, program audio, for example, is introduced to the machine through this module right here, which provides the driving current for the audio heads. Uh, here we have a video input module immediately followed by a modulator where the FM signal is first produced. Then we have a group of four identical recording amplifiers which further refine the FM signal and adjust its level appropriately to meet the requirements of each of the individual heads. I think it might be instructive if we withdraw one of these modules to give you some impression of the physical construction that's been employed in this particular type of machine. Here we have this happens to be one of the uh, video record amplifiers, and you can get some impression of the manner in which this type of uh, transistorized uh, circuitry is designed. The transistors themselves are not mounted in, socket, in sockets, but are directly soldered into the circuit. You may be able to pick out a number of them down in this area here, and there are some large power transistors associated with the actual driving of the video heads up in this area up here. You'll note that rather conventional components are used in this particular type of equipment, but the layout is designed for easy serviceability and easy troubleshooting. Uh, down in the other, in the uh, forward end of this module assembly, uh, you'll see some of the switches and potentiometers associated with the control functions. There happens to be a video delay line uh, that actually delays the FM signal in this case, associated with this uh, module, a number of transistors and other small components. One of the standard features provided uh, with a machine of this sort to make it easy for the customer to use is a module extender, which will enable any one of these modules to be operated in its withdrawn position, about as you see here, uh, for ease in troubleshooting. Well, let's restore this into its normal position and direct our attention over to the second module bank immediately under the transport. Here we have circuits that are associated with the video playback function. There's a group of four identical uh, video playback amplifiers, which again uh, amplify the FM signals recovered from the head, from the four heads. Then there's an FM switcher, which transforms the four channels down into one by switching at the appropriate instant so that a single continuous signal emerges from this switcher module. Then there is a limiter, which uh, gets rid of all level variations in the FM signal recovered from the tape. 
a demodulator which recovers the video signal, and then a rather complex group of circuit modules associated with the processing amplifier function. The process of regenerating the signal is actually one of the more complex processes in the machine. It's necessary to employ a number of AFC systems and pulse counting circuits and the like to regenerate the sync and blanking components of the signal. Now, most of the other modules that you see here are associated with the servo systems that are required in the tape recorder. The tape recorder requires a minimum of two servo systems, and some versions of the machine actually employ a grand total of three to control certain important uh, aspects in the mechanical operation of the machine. There is one capstan, there is one servo system that controls the speed and the phase of the rotating head wheel assembly. There is another one that controls the speed of the capstan, which in turn controls the speed with which tape is pulled through the machine. Uh, this is necessary, of course, in, in order to make it possible for the video heads in the playback process to track accurately across these uh, transverse tracks as they're laid down across the width of the tape. And finally, in some machines, it doesn't happen to be characteristic of this particular model, there is a servo system, an automatic control system, which establishes very precisely the position of the vacuum guide, which pushes the tape up against the rotating head wheel. In this particular machine, there is only a mechanical, a, man a manual adjustment for that purpose, but there are some electronic uh, correction circuits that operate on the final signal to give very much the same overall effect as if there were a mechanical automatic control system. Well, with that much uh, introduction to the overall concept of the machine, I think it might be appropriate to uh, conduct just a bit of a demonstration to show uh, uh, some parts of the machine in actual operation. In general, the record and playback functions are slightly separated on the machine in order to uh, minimize the the chance that an operator will make an error by uh, uh, making a, uh, pushing a record button, so to speak, when a, a good tape is mounted on the machine. In general, the controls you see associated with this panel right here are those that are used for playback. Uh, those that are associated with the record function are located uh, somewhat separately over on the opposite side of the machine. Uh, so, as I say, to minimize the possibility of making any kind of an operational error. There are a lot of convenience features provided in a, a machine of this sort to fit the requirements of the broadcast industry. For example, there's a rather complete group of switches here for monitoring various uh, signals at uh, strategic points in the machine. The upper row of button controls the display on a picture monitor. The lower row of buttons is associated with a built-in waveform monitor or oscilloscope, which uh, is an important accessory or important uh, uh, item in the overall machine. There are also uh, little features like the microphone mounted in a retractable uh, holder here, which enables an operator very readily to add uh, identifying information or speak uh, audio notes, if you will, to be applied to the cue track in the uh, machine for identification of recordings or recording of any uh, uh, particular technical difficulties that might have been encountered in that, in that type of thing. Now, returning to the uh, basic transport panel, let me indicate what a few of the uh, basic functions are. As you might uh, expect, there is one uh, button that is marked play, and in normal operation, the only uh, action necessary to activate the recorder once a recording has been proper, record, recorded tape has been properly loaded on the transport is to depress the uh, play button. Uh, however, there are additional facilities associated with the uh, transport. I just pressed the stop button, obviously, there. There is a standby mode, which puts the uh, recorder in a mode that is very much like play, except that the pinch roller is not energized, so the tape is not actually placed in motion. However, the motors are brought up to speed. Uh, all other circuits are in normal operating condition, and it's possible to check out a number of important uh, details of machine operation in this particular mode. There are also modes called wind. Uh, forward wind, which, uh, as its name implies, gives you a fast forward action, and reverse wind. The machine comes to a stop and, as you see, speeds up in the opposite direction. By jockeying these two switches around and noting the uh, reading on the tape timer, it is possible for an operator to rather quickly locate any desired segment in the tape or to rewind the tape uh, rather quickly after a recording is complete. 
Now let's place the machine in the playback mode. Uh, while we were preparing for this little demonstration, we recorded several minutes of a color bar signal that appears on the picture monitor very much like a grayscale uh, in order to just give us a signal that will enable us to demonstrate several important aspects of the machine operation. One of the controls uh, down here on the control panel is one marked control track phase. Uh, this controls the relative timing with which the capstan pulls the tape through the machine. Uh, there is a meter located immediately above it on which one uh, tunes for a maximum, so to speak. You adjust this control track phase uh, so as to get a maximum reading on this meter. Uh, this means that you are pulling tape in just the right phase so that each video head is passing directly over one of the tracks on the tape. Now there are four possible positions for this control track phase knob. Uh, since the uh, head number one on the video head wheel can be made to scan the tracks that were produced by head number one, two, three, or four. Uh, this is really controlling the operation of the capstan servo system. Now we can see a number of other interesting details of machine operation if we direct our attention to the picture monitor. One of the important uh, characteristics of this type of machine is that the information in the video signal is recorded in sequence by a series of heads. The relative uh, speed of the, the heads uh, compared to the uh, frequency of the television signal is such that a band of approximately 16 lines in the television signal is reproduced by uh, each head before it is uh, moved along and another head moves in to take its place. Now if we deliberately disable one of the head channels, you get the sort of effect shown here, where you notice that roughly one-fourth of the picture breaks up, you have nothing but a noise band indicating that one of the four head channels has been removed. You notice also that the synchronizing information becomes uh, unstable because of the missing uh, 16 line bands. But the amount that we are removing from this image here corresponds to the amount of information that is scanned by each head in the system. It is quite easy to see the uh, contribution of each head in the uh, system by examining some of the uh, key waveforms that are associated with the machine. Uh, this built-in waveform monitor enables us to see some of the basic signals. Uh, what we're looking at here is the final video output from the machine producing the signal that you just uh, saw displayed on the kinescope. If uh, this is the signal after it has emerged from the processing amplifier, and you can notice that the synchronizing pulse and the blanking interval are displayed in rather clean fashion. As a matter of fact, there is an expand facility built into the waveform monitor that enables us to see that sync and blanking pulse uh, very clearly, and you see that it is uh, quite clean with very little uh, uh, crosstalk or other contaminating signals in this region. However, if we look at the signal just as it comes out of the demodulator, we find something rather different about the character of the signal. Now there is a great deal of uh, residual noise on the synchronizing pulse. This happened to have been a color signal, so there's the remains of a burst appearing over here on the back porch area. Again, we can see this in a little bit more detail if we enlarge the the waveform. But after passing through the processing amplifier, uh, this signal is rather completely cleaned up, giving you the same effect that we observed a moment ago. This is, of course, a horizontal rate display. This is one line from here to here, another line from here to here. Now, another waveform monitoring facility provided in the machine is the output of the FM switcher. Here you see a display showing the FM signal. One of the uh, significant things about this is that you can identify the contributions of each of the head channels. As a matter of fact, if I deliberately lower the level of one of the channels, you'll see the waveform reduce in amplitude in one part of the display. It's also significant that this level is not particularly stable. If you notice uh, carefully, you see it sort of bobbling around. Uh, this is an indication that the uh, capstan servo is doing its job in, in uh, holding the, the head centered over the tape the minute it starts to uh, move off the, uh, the track just a little bit, the head moves off the track, the capstan servo operates to correct it so that the uh, maximum level of signal tends to be preserved at all times. But you see the little bit of uh, residual variation that is more or less intrinsic in the tape recording medium. In order to monitor the operation of the uh, servo systems, there is a special display provided 
which enables one to see some of the key waveforms. I'm afraid the details don't show up at all well in the uh, display that we're seeing here, but there are displays shown that enable an operator to see quite readily uh, exactly in what condition the capstan servo is operating. You can also check for the continuity or the presence of the various pulses associated with the headwheel servo system as well. One other important uh, aspect of the machine that I'd like to demonstrate is the significance of the positioning of this vacuum guide. I've mentioned several times that it's very important that the guide be positioned accurately if you're going to avoid geometric errors in the image. Uh, to show why that is, I can deliberately misadjust the vacuum guide with a little adjustment here. And if you can get a view of the waveform monitor, I see that I've just gone past the point where the recording was made, so I'll have to back up the tape uh, for just a moment here in order to recover the signal that I uh, need to demonstrate this particular effect. I have picked up about 30 seconds. I now need... Uh, well, that gives me about a minute of tape if I stop it there. Now, if I put it back in the play mode and wait just a moment for the signal to stabilize, you now can see a display on the picture monitor. And when I misadjust this vacuum guide, you'll notice a very definite jogging or Venetian blind effect, wherein each band in the picture uh, separates uh, in such a way that the timing varies from the top to the bottom of the band. Uh, this is the basic... Uh, error which is developed in the signal uh, whenever the vacuum guide is not set to quite the proper position. We can take that distortion out of the picture by restoring the proper adjustment as I'm now doing. If you take it off in the other direction, of course, the jogs go off in the other direction. Let's put it back to the point where the vertical lines in the image are all properly reproduced. Well, we've had time to, to discuss only a few of the many features and aspects associated with a complex system like the television tape recorder, but I trust that you have some impression as to the, the physical nature of the machine and some of the functions that it can perform. In practice, these machines are designed so that they can accept a very wide range of accessories. I've commented on the color stabilization circuits that can be added. There are certain other facilities such as electronic editing facilities that enable one to achieve the equivalent of a splice in the videotape without actually having to physically cut the tape and join another piece to it. There are also more sophisticated types of servo systems. Arrangements can be made to operate the machine on international scanning standards rather than just the American standards and so on. But I think what we have shown should have been enough to convince you that the television tape recorder is indeed a good example of the application of the electronic engineer's art. RCA, the most trusted name in television. <laughs>